Hello, hello and welcome back to CS492G Foundation and Future of Virtual Reality, Artificial Intelligence and Massively Multi-User Online Role-Playing Games. We're in part two of this course talking about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, <clears throat> finally we've reached the part where we talk about the mathematics of machine learning. So last time we learned about uh, the C dimension and about the concept of shattering, the combinatorial concept. And today we're continuing in that direction, talking about uh, 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 pack learning and uh, about uh, the complexity of um, uh, learning uh, concepts as expressed by, uh, by the uh, so this presentation is given by Sarah. So I'm going to uh, move the spotlight to Sarah and uh, should be able to share your screen. Okay, can you see my slides and hear me well? Okay, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Zahra and today I'm going to talk about Saur Shalah Lemma. So let's get started. So here is the title of content that I'm gonna discuss today. First of all, I'd like to mention that since Saur Shalah Lemma is built on VC dimension, I thought it would be necessary to recap once more shattering and recap the VC dimensions then move on to our main topic today's main topic sour shell lemma next uh, we are gonna take a look at its proof and uh, see the main idea behind its proof but not in a detailed way like uh, next i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna show some extended version of sour shell lemma and some polynomial bounds Finally, I'd like to introduce some applications of the lemma in machine learning and uh, as well as in the other fields. But before starting my presentation, I'd like to introduce a couple of definitions. They're, they're not something new, but throughout our presentation, I'll either assume that these uh, definition or I'll, I'll be using them. So for, for convenience, uh, let's take a look at them one by one. So here we have X, uh, which is the population or universe. We can call it the set of objects or like set of all the points that we wish to classify. Next, uh, we have mu, which is a distribution function, basically. It's over X. For example, when we say that we want to classify, uh, we want to choose X from this uh, population, capital X, uh, with distribution mu, it means that the uh, probability that these x will come out will be mu x. Here mu can be any kind of probability function, it doesn't matter. It can be, for example, uniform distribution over some interval, or it can be even normal distribution with given mean and variance. Uh, next, we have training data. Uh, in machine learning, uh, we call it training data because, for example, if we have uh, n number of input data, when we call it x1, x2, xn, and we have also corresponding labelings for them, uh, y1, y2, yn. And using those uh, n pairs of points, I would say, for example, x1, y1, xn, yn, we're able actually training our model. When we input, uh, when we give x1 as an input, we are uh, expecting to get y1 as an output. If not, then we are uh, Calc calculating the loss function and etc. Uh, next, we have C star, which is an optimal classifier. W what do we mean by an optimal classifier? It actually means that it correctly classifies every point of the population X. Uh, next, we have C, capital C. This is the family of possible classifiers. Uh, we can otherwise, in, in the other way, we can call it a set of functions from x to 0, 1. Also, I would like to mention that uh, throughout the presentation and in our lemma, we are uh, assuming that we have 
binary classification. It means that if we have we have any input data, we can have any kind of input data, but our output can be either zero or one. Uh, let's start with the recap of shattering. Uh, you may already know what is shattering, but let's take a look at it one more time. Uh, we can call uh, shattering, we can define shattering in this way. For any set, subset of X, we can call this set U. Uh, we, we say that U is shattered by family C. If the classifiers in C are able to give all the two to the power of U, uh, cardinal of U possible classification of this point. Here, this notation means the number of elements in the U. Uh, in our pr previous presentation, actually, Abbas told us that what was the sh uh, shattering in uh, with other kind of examples. I'll just like to generalize this example one more time. Uh, you can you may ask one more question as well. Can all sets of points be actually shattered? Uh, what do you think about that? Is there any? It, uh, can there be any case that we can actually not be able to shatter those points using any kind of classifiers? Actually, we can. Uh, sometimes we, we are not able to shatter the given points using the classifiers that we have. Uh, we are going to take a look at two kinds of examples here. Also, uh, we can call shattering in this way as well. For example, we say that machine F can shatter a set of points, let's say X1, X2, and XR, if and only if for every possible training set, there exists some value of weights that gets zero training error. It's, uh, th these definitions are basically the same. Uh, so I'll give two examples. In one of them, we are able to shatter given points, and the other one, in the other one, we are not able to shatter those points. Uh, for example, uh, suppose that our population is two-dimensional plane and C is a family of linear classifiers. Here, uh, linear classifiers is mentioning that family of linear classifiers is really important because if it's not linear, then we not only have the, those four cases, we, we may have a lot of cases. In this case, uh, we can have four possible cases. One of them is one negative, three positive, uh, uh, one negative, one, uh, one positive, two positive, two negative, and the reverse, one positive, one negative. As you may see from the this, this picture, uh, in all of the cases, we are actually able to classify the data, uh, split the plane into two parts where one of them has only positive points and one of them has only negative points. So uh, as you may see from this example, you use shattered by C. It means that she, uh, C shatters any set of two points in two-dimensional plane. What about the other case when we are not able to shatter those um, points? We can take it. Uh, we are not going to formally prove it here, but we can take a look at a set of four points where C is not able to shatter it. For example, as you may see from the first picture, uh, there is not exist a straight line that we can draw, uh, which separates th those planes in, into two parts that one of them only has uh, negative points and the other one only has positive. So uh, it means that uh, it's impossible to shatter using linear classifier these four points. Uh, we have a little bit, um, we have uh, more examples actually here. For example, uh, we can say that in two-dimensional plane, there will always be a set of three points that is shattered by C, where C is a family of linear classifiers. But, and in three-dimensional plane, there will be always a set of four points that is shattered by C. However, in two-dimensional plane, we cannot find a set of four points that is shattered by C. As similarly, in three-dimensional plane, there, the, there, there does not exist a set of four, five points that is shattered by C. Uh, we are not going to prove those results here, but I thought that they may be useful for understanding what is shattering. Now we are moving on to the VC dimension. Uh, so we can 
Define VC dimension for, formally as follows. For example, let X be the population again and C be the family of classifiers, as we already mentioned. The wapnik cherbonin case dimension of C is D. If we can, if there exists a set U with a number of elements D shattered by C, but there does not exist a set U with number of elements D plus one shattered by C. Actually, it means that the num maximum number of elements that can be shattered by C uh, must be the VC dimension. In our previous example with uh, two-dimensional plane and C, the set of linear classifier, we said the dimension was three, because if you remember, we said that in two-dimensional plane, we can find set of three points that are shattered by C, but we cannot find four points that are shattered by C. It means that our D here is three. Uh, as it's uh, also illustrated here, for example, when we have three points, we can have either these cases, Actually, we have more cases, but they are like symmetric, so we are not going to consider them. We have one plus here, two minus here, two plus here, one minus here, and all negative, or uh, we can say all positive. Uh, also, it's important to note that they are not uh, collinear. It means that the three of them are not on the same uh, on the same line. So here it shows that it's not possible to shatter them uh, for four points. So we have VC dimension three here. Now we're, we are going to take a look at a little bit of uh, interesting examples here. For example, uh, we are now supposing that we have finite C, the family of classifiers is finite. Obviously, we are not going to um, give exact value for this VC dimension in the case of finite C, but can we at least give an upper bound for the VC dimension? Actually, the answer is yes. We can give a give an upper bound for this one. Uh, so we can say that VC dimension is a measure of flexibility of space of function that can be learned like as a statistical classification algorithm. This measure is related to the number of parameters or number of degrees of freedom of the family of uh, family of classifiers. Uh, Suppose that we have a set of m points here. Then we'll have two to the power of m different possible labeling because, as we mentioned earlier, we we are doing binary classification for each point in the set of those m points. We are uh, for each point can be either one or zero, so it implies that uh, no, possible labelings will be at most two to the power of m. In order to classify to to, to do the classification task on those two to the power of m different cases, we have we need at least two to the power of m different classifiers, right? So it means that cardinal of C, which was the family of classifiers, must be small, uh, must be greater than or equal to two to the power of m. If we do the inequality here, uh, we solve the inequality here, we get m must be smaller than or equal to logarithm of this cardinal to C base two. So, uh, but do we get actually upper bound for the VC dimension? Here we, we are only, um, as you see, we only get the upper bound for M, but how, how does it relate to the VC dimension? Actually, M and VC dimension can be, can be seen as the same thing here, because as we mentioned earlier, it's the maximum number of points that can be arranged so that a classifier from C can shatter them. So we can, uh, substitute this m with vc dimension because both of them are the number of points here um, so m can be a vc dimension and m can be seen as this uh, kind of same thing here so we, we can use the, this upper bound here as well uh, it means that vc dimension in this case will be smaller than or equal to logarithm of uh, cardinal of c base 2 we have two more interesting examples as well. Now we are consider we are supposing that C is every possible classifier and X only consists of zero or one. In this case, since every classifier is in C, this family shatters sets of any size. It means that there is not maximum number as we uh, mentioned before. A VC dimension must be infinite. Uh, 
the reason that I'm giving this example is to showing that actually we see dimension is not always something that is finite. It can have infinite, uh, it, it can be, in, in some cases, it can be infinite. The second case is neural network with activation function value and k parameters. As a quick recap of neural networks, in the neural network, we say that we have n different in inputs, for example, x1, x2, xn, and also bias term. Then we're going to have some weights corresponding to those inputs, let's say w1, w2, wn, and wb for corresponding to bias term. Then we are doing the weighted sum of those inputs and weights like x1, w1, xn, wn, plus a b, wb. And then we are sending those sum, and we're taking the sum and then sending this, this sum to the activate the nonlinear activation function. Those activation function can be different, like sigmoid, ReLU, but here we are assuming that our activation function is ReLU and parameter number is k. Uh, ReLU was the, if you don't remember, I, I just want to remind you that ReLU was, was just maximum between uh, 0 and uh, z, for example, uh, for negative numbers, the ReLU will be zero, and for positive numbers, it will be just uh, the number itself. So it's a linear function. For this family of classifiers, we said dimension is going to be equal to k. Uh, we are not going to prove that result here, but uh, it's one of the interesting results of VC dimensions. As uh, sometimes we see dimension at number of, and number of parameters can be same, but it doesn't mean that actually they are formally correlated. Uh, there is not much uh, relation, formal relation between them. Uh, sometimes they can coincide, but it's important to know the difference between these dimension and parameters and not confuse them. Uh, so far, we have intuition that VC dimension is related to the degree of freedom, and uh, we saw some examples that support this idea. Uh, but we still have one question unanswered. Uh, how does VC dimension actually capture the flexi flexibility of our classifiers? Uh, for In order to answer this question, I have to introduce a few more notations as well. I'm so sorry for too many notations, but they're just for convenience. So for uh, we say that for any subset of x, we will denote this subset as x1 uh, as equal to x1, x2, and xm. Uh, this x are, x's are from our population space, as we already mentioned in the beginning of the class. And here we have another definition, another notation as well, cs. This, these are just a set of labelings on s that are induced by c. Uh, it means that this cs will be uh this cs will consist of only zeros and ones because cx1 cxm those are those are uh, either one or zero because c small c is just the classifier from those family of classifiers we have one more important notation here as well uh square c square bracket m for, for any natural number m, we say that the maximum number of ways to split m points using classifiers in C will be called Cm. It's important here because in the statement of our lemma, our uh, sauer schellach lemma, we are using this notation, so it's it's good to keep that in mind. <laughs> now we are finally moving on to uh, the statement of our lemma. Our lemma, Sarushala lemma, says that uh, suppose that the VC dimension of family of classifiers is C, then for all M, we are going to have this C square bracket of M will be smaller than or equal to phi dm. Uh, this phi dm is just a notation for uh, M choose I, where I starts from zero and ends at D. D is a VC dimension of C. It's not important here, it's just for uh, making it a little bit shorter. How do we actually prove it? There were uh, a few proofs for this lemma, but I thought that the easiest one was the proof by indu induction. Uh, this proof proceeds by induction on both D and M. As usual, we have base cases. Uh, in this case, we have two base cases, not only one. Uh, the first base case is m equal to zero and d is arbitrary, and the second base case is when d is equal to zero and m is arbitrary. 
Uh, so first, uh, let's start with the first base case. When, is, uh, when m is equal to zero, it means that our here we said that m is just the number of points in this subset S. When, is, uh, when m is equal to zero, it means that there is no element. It's just an, um, an empty set. It means that there can only be one subset. This is the empty set. Uh, so we'll have c square bracket of zero must be smaller than or equal to one, which is equal to phi d zero. Phi d zero means that zero choose zero because we have m is equal to zero. Uh, zero choose zero means zero factorial or zero factorial, it's all, it's one. So our first base case is actually true. The inequality holds for our first base case. For the second base case, we are assuming that d, which was the VC dimension of c is zero. A VC dimension was the maximum number of points that can be shattered. If it's zero, it means that no sets of points can be shattered, uh, which means that all the points in this set can be labeled actually in just one way, uh, which means that C square bracket M must be equal to one, and which is uh, always smaller than or equal to P zero M because we know that this expression this sum must be always smaller it must be always greater than zero and naturally it must be greater than or equal to one so our second base case also holds so we are done with the base case now let's move on to uh, part where we ac we're actually going to use our induction hypothesis first we're assuming that for induction uh, in the induction part, we are assuming that for all m prime d prime, such that m prime smaller than or equal to m, and d prime smaller than or equal to d, and at least one of these inequalities is strict, it means that either m prime smaller than m, d prime smaller than or equal to d, or d prime smaller than d, m prime smaller than or equal to m, will have c m prime uh, must be smaller than or equal to phi d prime m prime. This is just the statement of our lemma. We're just uh, assuming that this holds for the these m prime and d prime. And we're going to show that actually it holds for all m and d. Now suppose that we have a set S of cardinal m. We actually know this uh, beforehand, that if we have a set and it consists of m different elements, which were chosen from our space x. Uh, this proof is a little bit co constructive, so we're going to construct a new function, which is s. Uh, th this will be a class of functions defined only over x1, x2, xm, such that cs is equal to hs and it's equal to h. Uh, one more time, cs was the old possible labelings here. CS was a set of all labelings on S that are induced by C, and it was consists of either it consists of either zero or one. So uh, since any subset of S that is shattered by H is also shattered by C, we have that VC dimension of H must be smaller than or equal to VC dimension of C. It's because this inequality, uh, this equality that CS is equal to HS. So we are uh, we get this result. We see dimension of H must be smaller than or equal to VC dimension of C. Now we are introducing two more uh, functions. Actually, we are dividing H. Is we are kind of dividing H into two parts, H1 and H2, and then we are gonna do induction both H1 and H2, and we will see the result. Uh, so we construct H1 in the following way. For each possible labelings of x1, x2, and xm minus 1, uh, it will be we add a representative function from h to h1. And we are defining h2 such as h minus h1. Like the sum of them will be uh, h, h1 and h2. So for each h, uh, for each element from h2, we are going to have some h tilde from h1 such that for the first m minus one elements we are going to have the same label we are going to have the same results for both function h and h tilde but for the from the for the last element xm these results are going to differ it means that h xm is not going to be equal to h tilde xm uh, so here, for for convenience, we are going to use h xm as one and h tilde xm as zero, but it it doesn't 
uh, it's not actually a big deal here. Uh, it, just for convenience, we are using this one and zero. So for construction, by construction, we're we going to have cardinal of CS is equal to cardinal of HS, which is equal to cardinal of H1S plus cardinal of H2S. It was because, again, we had here that uh, CS is equal to HS. It means that their cardinals are already equal. And the next one are coming from this, that H, we split H into two parts, H1 and H2. So their cardinality must be the... the some of their cardinality must be equal to the cardinality of HS. Uh, since H1 was actually a subset of H, because we are choosing H1 from H and H2 from H. So it means that VC dimension of H1 must be smaller than VC dimension of H. On the other hand, we, ha we have that VC dimension of H must be smaller than VC dimension of C. And we have that VC dimension of C is D. So it's means that VC dimension of H1 must be smaller than D. Uh, on the other hand, we can show that H1S, the cardinal of H1S doesn't change if we find the cardinal of H1S when we remove XM from this set. Uh, I'm not gonna prove it here because it's a little bit, it's making things a little bit complicated, but if we assume that this is true, then by induction, we are gonna naturally have that H1S cardinality must be smaller than phi dm minus one. Uh, and for the other parts, for the H2 parts, uh, we omit details again, but uh, we can actually show that we see the dimension of H2 must be smaller than d minus one. And by induction, if we accept that this is true, if we accept that cardinal of uh, H2S must be equal to cardinal of H2, X1, X2, Xm minus one, like even we uh, remove Xm from this set, the cardinals must remain the same. Then by induction, we are gonna have H2S cardinality must be smaller than or equal to phi D minus one, M minus one. We actually get two important results here. First of them was the cardinal of H1 minus H1S, which was smaller than or equal to phi dm minus one. And the second important result was cardinal of H2S, which was smaller than or equal to phi d minus one m minus one. We for uh, to in order to prove in order to use our index uh, in order to prove our lemma, we need actually uh, some of them because uh, as you remember H1S plus H2S, like some of their cardinality was here, just CS. So if we some if we find some of these inequalities, we are getting this. Uh, the cardinality of CS must be smaller than or equal to phi d m minus one plus phi d minus one m minus one. Uh, let's now calculate right-hand side, this part. Uh, if we do like basic math here, we are going to get that uh, this right hand side is actually equal to m choose i, where i starts from zero and ends at d. d is the vc dimension of c. So we are almost done because we showed that the cardinal of cs must be smaller than this, and this is just phi dm, uh, what we we are asked to prove. So we get cs cardinal of cs smaller than or equal to phi dm, and we are done. Uh, but you may ask that uh, in the statement of the theorem lemma, we have c square bracket of m must be smaller than or equal to phi dm. But we just showed that cardinal of cs is smaller than or equal to phi dm. Actually, it's there just the same thing. Because as you remember here, we had that c square bracket of m was just maximum of those cs. If it holds for cs, it's uh, obviously uh, it's satisfied for C square bracket of M as well. So we are uh, done with the proof. Uh, do, do you maybe have any questions? Okay, so, so far we proved that uh, this lemma holds, like uh, C square bracket of M must be smaller than or equal to feed the M. In other words, maximum number of ways to split M points must be smaller than or equal to M choose I, this sum. M choose I where I starts at zero and ends at D. It's pretty cool, but maybe can we introduce a polynomial bound to make it even useful or to make it even cooler? 
Actually, the answer is yes. Yes, we can do that too. It's uh, our second lemma. Sometimes uh, sour shell lemma is actually stated in this form, is used in this form rather than the first form. But here in, we have an important assumption here. We are assuming that M is uh, bigger, M is greater than or equal to D. If it holds, then we have phi dm, which was again just this sum, m choose i, where i starts at zero and ends at d. Uh, now we have that phi dm must be smaller than or equal to em over d to the power of d. Uh, how do we show that? It's pretty simple because since m must be m is greater than or equal to d, we have that d over m must be smaller than or equal to one. Uh, in the left most of the inequality, you see this kind of expression. Uh, if you look at this expression, we have here d over m to the power of d and this binomial sum again. Uh, d over m is something smaller than 1, so if we raise it to the power of d, it's actually getting smaller than we raise it to the power of i. So doing rather than doing it, we are just using uh, d over m to the power of i in every element of the sum, and we just uh, find the product of these two numbers. Uh, next inequality comes from assumption that d was smaller than or equal to m. Here, we are just changing the bound from d to m, because m is uh, something smaller, uh, something greater than d. Uh, finally, we have that this expression is equal to 1 plus d over m to the power of m, it, this is a binomial theorem, as you remember. For example, a plus b to the power of n was just n to zero a to the power of n plus blah, 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 something. Yeah, it was just a binomial theorem. And lastly, we have that 1 plus d over m to the power of m must be smaller than or equal to e to the power of d. Uh, this, is, this comes from inequality that 1 plus x must be smaller than or equal to e to the power of x. It's actually coming from Tyler expansion of e to the power of x because it's e to the power of x is equal to 1 plus x plus x to the power of 2 over 2 plus uh, and so on. Uh, it's obviously uh, greater than 1 plus x. So we get these results. And we have leftmost expression here and rightmost we have e to the power of d. If we move d over m to the power of d to the other side of the inequality, we are getting what we need. So uh, we are done with the proof. Since we uh, we have shown that phi dm is smaller than or equal to this polynomial, polynomial, polynomial expression, we are actually also showing that c square bracket of m is smaller than this polynomial expression. But uh, what, what is the reason that, what, what is the reason of showing this polynomial bound? Uh, Sauer shellah lemma shows that when m becomes larger than d, the function cm increase polynomially rather than exponentially with sample size m. Uh, sometimes we can call, we call this cm sometimes as gross function, and it's really important uh, for classifiers uh, for characterizing cl classifiers. So that's why it's important to know that um, it's uh, increased um, polynomially rather than exponentially with the sample size. Uh, there are different kind of form formulation of Sarashella lemma. This one is uh, called Pajor's formulation. It says that for every finite family of sets, there is another family of equally many sets such that each set in the second family is shattered by the first family. Uh, in this example, we have, for example, one, two, and three green uh, sets, and we also have one, two, and three uh, blue sets here. One of them is just empty sets here. One blue set is empty. It says that uh, the green sets actually shatters all the blue sets and their number are the same. Uh, they, uh, we have three green sets and we have three blue sets. Uh, finally, we have uh, the applications. Uh, Sarish Kalav Lemma is mainly used in machine learning and probably approximately correct learning. Uh, it's actually the topic of uh, upcoming, 
the topic of the up, up, upcoming presentation, so I'm not going to uh, give too many too much details about that, but it's just uh, probably approximately correct learning is a framework for mathematical analysis of machine learning. Uh, in this framework, the learner receives samples and must select the generalization function from a certain class of possible functions. And the lemma is also used in computational geometry, especially in range searching, the randomization, and approximation algorithms. Range searching problem, problems consist of processing a set C of objects in order to determine which objects from C intersect the queer object, which is called range. And also in the graph theory, it's, it was uh, shown by Cosma and Moran that they, they have used generalization of Saura Shellah lemma and they've proved some results in graph theory, such as the number of strong orientations of a given graph is sandwiched between its number of connected and two edge connected subgraphs, and etc. Yeah, these are my references, and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I'm sorry if I made it a little bit complicated and made it boring, but yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so, so much. Yes, what we've seen here is a very important part of the foundation of machine learning, right? So for example, it was pointed out that the uh, um, C dimension of a, a neural net is roughly corresponds to the number of edges, right? So intuitively, Having more edges in your neural net makes it more expressive, makes it able to learn more complicated concepts. And this is being made rigorous in this very sense in terms of the VC dimension, right? So, yes, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, this uh, was uh, pretty complicated mathematics, quantitative combinatorics. And uh, I think Sarah did an excellent job in and making this uh, involved uh, uh, concepts accessible. But we'll talk about the uh, assessment of a presentation later. And all, um, uh, again, we're going to take a short break. And in that break, you're uh, encouraged and asked to uh, take some notes and some questions and some co uh, comments uh, about the content of the presentation. So quick break of like five minutes for now. And here we're back from the break. Yes, so this is the part where we jointly discuss the content of the presentation, ask questions about the content, provide comments about the content, but uh, refrain from assessing and evaluating the quality or style of the presentation that will be a separate part later. So maybe Zaha, you, you share the slides again and then uh, you guys get to ask some questions and make comments. Right, so which part? Did you understand or not understand? Which part would you like to uh, have some additional explanation of? Who has uh, seen this concept of VC dimension and shattering before? No one, yes, that's what I suppose. And that's not your fault. It's, uh, I'm going to blame this <clears throat> on the recent type of artificial intelligence, uh, which uh, really has a, a, a strong deficiency in foundations. Although these concepts have been known for many decades and uh, have so many applications, this is kind of like, uh, differentiability, everybody learns differentiability in high school, right? And uh, shattering in VC dimension, I think is 
of equal importance in discrete mathematics, not in the continuous realm. And of course, if you see differentiability for the first time, it's uh, kind of difficult to process, but since you all learned this in high school, uh, by now you're all familiar with it. Same with VC dimension, it takes some time to digest, but then it becomes uh, some very, you realize that it's a very natural and powerful tool to evaluate, quantitatively evaluate combinatorial systems. Okay, fair enough, no problem. Um, so we're going to continue this uh, part on Thursday um, with a presentation about PEC learning. That's the best one can hope for in machine learning, right? We can never hope that a, a system that has been trained for hours or weeks or months is uh, always and fully correct. That's a, a huge conceptual difference to algorithms, right? An algorithm that you uh, learn in CS300 or CS500, um, we make a deliberate effort to prove correctness of an algorithm. That's really what distinguishes an algorithm from a heuristic. Heuristic is something that uh, seems to work uh, uh, in practice uh, most of the time, unless it doesn't. Uh, that's a distinctive feature of a heuristic that you cannot really rigorously rely on it, whereas an algorithm is required to rely on. The machine learning uh, entirely gives up this uh, uh, rigorous reliance, uh, the best one can hope for is that it works most of the time and formalizing what it means most of the time about pack learning. That's a topic of next Thursday talk. So that's a kind of a, uh, the, the cliffhanger for, for you about the content. So that wraps things up for today. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask the uh, speakers, uh, next upcoming speakers to remain online and uh, the rest of the class is already dismissed. Have a great evening and see you again on Thursday.